I'm Rachna Singh. I'm BC's Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives. And I'm so grateful to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, of the Songhees and the Eskimal First Nations. Thank you, all of you, for joining us for an, for an historic announcement for Indi indigenous peoples and racialized communities of British Columbia. Today, we are introducing the Anti-Racism Data Act. This new act will help us to combat systemic racism and to make government systems and programs better for more people. It has taken a lot of time and effort to make this act a reality, as well as the support of countless people, many of whom are joining us today in person and also virtually. Thank you to the countless people who have supported this work, to the indigenous peoples and community organizations who took part in our engagement, the thousands of British Columbians who shared their thoughts, and key stakeholders such as Kasari Gawander, BC's Human Rights Commissioner, Dr. Mary Ellen Turple Lafond, and members of the First Nations Leadership Council, Regional Chief Terry P.G., Grand Chief Stu Stuart Phillip, Chief Lydia Witsum, Chief Don Tom, Coopy Judy Wilson, Robert Phillips, Cheryl Kessimer. To talk more about this important legislation, I'm joined by Premier John Horgan, Dr. June Francis, Director of the Institute for Diaspora Research Engagement, Associate Pro Professor at BD School of Business, SFU, and Chair of the Hoggins Alley Society. Unfortunately, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and Chief Lydia Wheatsum are unable to join us in person today due to separate, unforeseen circumstances. But we are very pleased to be joined virtually today by representatives of the First Nations Leadership Council, Robert Phillips, the First Nations Summit Political Executive, and Regional Chief, Terry T.G. of the BC Assembly of First Nations. This is a province shaped by diversity, with people from all over the world choosing to come here and build a better life. Yet too many people are held back by systemic racism and colonial biases preventing them from getting ahead. We can and we must do better. Over the last year, we have worked closely with people from communities most impacted by systemic racism to deliver meaningful and lasting change. Thousands of people across British Columbia shared their diverse perspectives and experiences of using government services. Their voices are reflected in the Anti-Racism Act, which we are introducing today. The legislation has also been co-developed with the Indigenous and Métis leadership, the first of its kind in Canada to be co-developed with Indigenous peoples. <laughs> this legislation will not just benefit Indigenous peoples, Métis people, and racialized communities, though. It will help us to make programs and services better for everyone in this province. We have already seen how government can use data to bring about positive change. For example, we know that indigenous, black, and people of color are underrepresented in BC's tech sector. That's why we are working with key sector partners to provide 29 million funding through the Innovator Skills Ini Initiative program. This funding will help us help up to 3,000 people from underrepresented communities, including women and non-binary people, two as, uh, two as uh, S LGBTQ+, indigenous, black, and people of color, get their first job in the tech sector or in a tech-enabled role. We all know that data is a powerful tool to bring about change. And as we roll this legislation out across government and the public sector, we expect to see more positive outcomes like this. The introduction of this act is a monumental step 
but it does not mean that data collection will start today. Instead, it allows government to put in place a framework to collect the information in a way that is safe, secure, and sensitive to communities' needs. It prioritizes transparency and accountability by requiring the province to release statistics annually to show how data is being used. And it also fo focuses on preventing and minimizing community harms so that communities do not experience further marginalization or discrimination as a result of this act. We know that some indigenous peoples and members of racialized communities have concerns about government collecting personal data. It's important to note that this act will not require anyone to provide information if they are not comfortable doing so. And what our recent engagement has shown us is that indigenous peoples and racialized communities see this legislation as being a vehicle of change. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. June Francis, to talk a little bit more about just what this means to the racialized communities in British Columbia. Dr. June Francis. Well, that was quite a welcome, and I must say, this is indeed a glorious day, a day that we can all celebrate. I think it's so important, I'm Jamaican, and I must say that we take time to rejoice, to take joy in the moments when we succeed. And I just say, before I get into any remarks, that I think we must always take these moments to recognize and acknowledge the enormous work uh, and the moment that has brought us to be here. And think about the ancestors. I know my own ancestors and the ancestors of indigenous people and racialized communities need to be acknowledged today for the work that they did to bring us to this point. And I just want to acknowledge that. I want to thank the leadership here, and I am usually a critic, <laughs> okay? So it takes a lot for me to get to the moment, but I think I just want to acknowledge the enormous leadership of the Premier, of, of P.S. Singh, of people like um, uh, 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 DM Angela Cook, and a whole host of other people that I cannot all name today. But I just want to, uh, as we say, big them up. <laughs> <laughs> acknowledge as well uh, as a stolen person who is sitting on stolen lands uh, that I um, work I know we have done the acknowledgement for Victoria but I would like to also acknowledge uh, the Musqueam, Squamish and Suela two people on whose lands I work and play on a daily basis at downtown SFU and at Hogan's Alley Society and in my home. Um, and I say today, when we look at where this is going to be tabled, I want you to take a look at this hall and the ha Hall of Honor Heroes, I think, and, and, and the library and all the places that we have had a tour of today. And, and I say it's auspicious and important to recognize that this was a space that was meant for some people, people of European ancestry, and they made that statement by importing marble from Italy, so that we all knew that. <laughs> and it was put on indigenous land and excluded the indigenous people and subsequent generations. So the fact that we are reclaiming this space, and that's what I'm saying, this legislation <laughs> reclaims this space. And as you look at those pictures, you know, the ones on the walls of the legislature, we expect in those colors to change too. So. <laughs> I think 
the tabling of this important legislation represents an enormous moment of opportunity. A promise, the promise that the government is making, all right? A promise to black, indigenous, and racialized community, and in fact, all British Columbians, um, because that promise uh, has been far too long in coming. For, because for far too long, communities have not received equitable uh, access treatment in, in government services, whether it's in housing, employment, education, I know that from my own field, social services, uh, we talked about uh, public service, you talked about um, economic opportunities, the justice system and health, and we could go on. Yet, these inequities were hidden. This is a key here. So it was always you couldn't find it. Because when you said it exists, people would say, how do you know that? Where is it? Prove it to me. Are you sure? Uh, come up with a new reason. Now, with this data legislation, we have an opportunity to shine light into dark places, to reveal and make transparent these inequities. And you see, because without data, without understanding a problem, you cannot fix it. You cannot actually fix it because you don't know what you're fixing. So this gives us the chance, the possibility to fix the inequities. This is what this represents. <laughs> And what I really um, think is also that the process that led to the legislation is as anti-racist and decolonial as the legislation itself. And I again applaud the process. Uh, the government, uh, you know, engaged with communities and listened to us to the very end and, and responded. And I have seldom seen this. And I just want to say that model is now a model that we can use to create the flourishing for all British Columbia. Process matters. <laughs> So I'm, you know, while I'm so delighted, this is only a start. Um, <laughs> you know, the goal is, as I said, to fix and address the inequities. But this legislation is a promise to all British Columbians, particularly those most impacted by racism, that the government will transform what they learn and what they understand from this data into transformative action. That is a promise that we must hold the government to as well. Yeah. I see among us many people, many, many people who have been working and calling for this and the advocacy of the community. I, I just wanna say, Thank you to all my colleagues and all the people who have been speaking tirelessly uh, to get us to this day. The government listened, but they wouldn't have anything to listen to if the advocates were not out there and communities were not um, putting themselves on the line to speak. And I just want to applaud that work and recognize it. Because um, it's only through this co-creation process that true change will come. So yes, I believe this is a moment of promise. And it's a moment that will allow us to lead to the kind of transformation and the changes that we will be holding the government to. And I know more legislation is coming. I assume resources are coming to back up this legislation because without money and resources, <laughs> this is just talk. <laughs> I will close with the African Ubuntu promise that I am because we are. In other words, each and every one of us in British Columbia will only flourish 
when we're all flourishing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. Like, I just don't even have words, like how much uh, this means to us, like your advocacy, your commitment to work, uh, to make life better for the vulnerable, marginalized communities. So thank you so much. And I'm always amazed by your energy. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Robert Phillips, with the First Nations Summit polit political executive to speak. He's joining us virtually today. Wait, Chukunuk, uh, Robert Phillips with the First Nations Summit, and certainly that's an excellent start to an excellent announcement. And I'd like to acknowledge where I'm at, acknowledge the Samath peoples of the Stalo Nation, and um, also as I live very near uh, to Sumas First Nation, where the Samath are, and the Matsqui First Nation as I live in Abbotsford. And uh, certainly acknowledge Parliamentary Secretary Singh and Premier Horgan who are also in attendance for their advocacy and hard work and commitment towards this important legislation. Uh, today is all about all of those who have been victims to systematic racism. Uh, for those that have faced terrible instances of being pushed to the side marginalized and subject to discrimination and intolerance. This is not the end, but it's just the beginning to chart a collective path to addressing this very important issue. While the legislation deals with racism experienced by many ethnic groups, we can only talk myself and Regional Chief Terry Tiji about the indigenous experience. We know that other affected marginalized groups will speak on their own experiences as we move forward. For far too long, our people have been disproportionately impacted by systematic racism, whether it be the legal system, medical system, government institutions, or in all other areas of society. This is reflective of the past 150 years of colonial legacy of discrimination that's been inflicted upon indigenous people. We have a long history of being victims of racism. We've been banned from our cultural practices, traditions, to, our, to the horrific residential school system that's been brought to light again in uh, the announcements now of our lost children. And we're overrepresented as well uh, in the justice system. And to just to name a few things. Today, we continue to be victims of systematic racism. In 2020, uh, we saw the instances of systematic racism uncovered in BC's medical system and resulting in invest investigation by Mary Ellen Terpel Lafon, which led to her recommendations in the Plain Sight Report. We commend the government for taking action to implement uh, these recommendations. We applaud the commitment by the province as well for Minister Jennifer Whiteside, who is going to conduct an independent investigation into the systematic racism and public education system. These are important commitments to addressing racism, but a quality data will be necessary to make the informed decisions leading to institutional and systematic change. Unfortunately, in many instances, the injustice of systematic racism has been invisible due to a lack of data. The anti-racism data legislation being introduced today will collect enhanced collection of data analysis and utilization of that data. However, in order to build trust in the data, it will be imperative to adhere to the principles of accountability and transparency and include oversight. As we have said many times over and over, nothing about us without us. We see the support of legislation as a critical step to addressing systematic racism that exists within our society. We look forward to continuing to work to address 
uh, the deeply important issues that affect us towards creating a more inclusive and just society. And this announcement is looked very favorably among Indigenous people and society. And I look forward to the work that's ahead. Cook's job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert Phillips, for your remarks and uh, also for joining us virtually today to mark the introduction of this legislation. And now I'm pleased to welcome Regional Chief Terry T.G. to speak. He's also joining us virtually today. Thank you, Parliamentary Secretary Singh. Deneza, Sekuza, Skyza, Samoigit, Samahanak, Samoigit. Masai Cho Kleitli Tane. I want to say a big thank you to the Kleitli Tane, the unceded, unsurrendered, continually occupied territory in north central interior of the Dakar people. I want to, to thank you, Parliamentary Secretary Singh and, and Premier Horgan, for this invitation to speak at this very important event in the history of British Columbia. I want to acknowledge Dr. June Francis with your good words this morning, starting us off in a good way. This new anti-racism data legislation that is being introduced today is a huge step in the right direction in terms of data collection regarding systemic racism and the discrimination faced by BIPOC peoples, Black, Indigenous people of color, it's a very important step and acknowledge the good work of uh, to you, uh, P.S. Singh, in regarding and engaging with our Indigenous peoples and also many of our racialized peoples. This legislation will move towards identifying and eliminating systemic racism and advancing racial equality. Many First Nations citizens have directly felt the impact of racism and hate in their lives as we've seen in the last several years, as we've seen in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where there is racist uh, policy that imposed against indigenous peoples. We worked with the province to engage with our First Nations peoples and to listen, solicit feedback to ensure a strong legislation that will improve in data collection use and access to race-based data. We worked in partnership to develop, to develop this legislation as per the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. I really want to uh, emphasize uh, Bill C-41, the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. It's important to acknowledge the, the critical step that this government took in enacting the DRIPA Act. The legislation intends to reduce systemic racism by enabling the collection, use, and disclosure of information to help identify and illuminate racial in inequities, gaps, and barriers in a variety of sectors, including the justice system, healthcare, and education system. This really complements the work that, that we are doing at the First Nations Leadership Council in implementing the recommendations of the In Plain Sight Report. I hope to see improved access to services and closing the gaps and barriers for all BIPOC people. I'm pleased and encouraged to see the legislation introduced today. This legislation will benefit First Nations and all British Columbians as we strive towards a more inclusive and equal society. I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank the, the government of BC and in particular yourself, Parliamentary Secretary Singh, for bringing us forward and bringing this legislation forward uh, and, and a really important day. I want to thank you all. This is a first step in a long journey. Masaicho. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Regional Chief TG, uh, for your remarks. I wish you could have been here in person and you could have felt the energy and the joy and the excitement that there is in the room. So, but thank you so much. Now, I would like to invite Premier Horgan to speak. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Roshna. Uh, Invited guests, uh, it is just truly an honor to be here today uh, to participate in the introduction of a first ever uh, race-based data legislation in the country. Uh, I want to thank all of you, particularly Parliamentary Secretary Singh, for all of the work that went into preparing to bring forward this legislation. And it is uh, with a significant amount of pride that I know uh, Minister Eby will stand uh, in a few uh, short minutes and be recognized by the first ever South Asian speaker in the legislature of British Columbia to introduce that legislation. And, and when he does so, he will be surrounded by the largest collection of non-Caucasian members that have ever sat in the BC legislature. Members of Chinese descent, members of South Asian descent, Filipino descent, LGBTQ, Indigenous descent, all of that, the first time ever, the largest group ever to be collected in a legislature, bringing forward legislation that is indeed long overdue, but process matters. And Dr. Francis, your remarks were inspiring, as they always are, and it makes it extremely difficult to follow. But, uh, and I know that there will be questions later on and process will be indeed part of that, but it is important. It's the creation of the legislation that I'm most proud of. Parliamentary Secretary Singh went out into the community and said, how do we create legislation that will work for you? As Dr. Francis said, for too long, racialized communities have been said, prove that. How do you know that? And the answer was, you have the information, why don't you look at it? Better yet, why don't you share that information with all British Columbians so that we can build the inclusive, diverse society that all of us talk about when we celebrate our multicultural heritage. I always say that I'm the son of an Irish immigrant, but it's got to be more than where you came from. It's what can we do tomorrow to make this dynamic, diverse, multicultural community also an anti-racist community. <laughs> Work, working uh, with Regional Chief uh, TG and, and uh, Robert uh, Phillip from the uh, First Nations Summit and indeed all of the Leadership Council as bringing forward the Declaration Act, again, a first in North America. What, what, now that we're a couple of years into it, of course, through a global pandemic, we're working on the, the action plan to deliver on the promise of the legislation. But again, as I look at this first steps when it comes to race-based data, I can look with some pride to the work that we have done with Indigenous communities, with uh, government officials across the board to build a, a work plan so that the Declaration does have more than just the promise of introduction, but the reality of an equitable society with First Peoples at the foundation, not at the periphery. It is, uh, it is truly inspiring uh, to be in a caucus that is more than 50% women. Uh, I was raised by a single mom and my sister, who I rarely give credit to, but those were the two most important women in my life until my wife came along and made, uh, made the other two less important. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I always tell Ellie that when I'm going to work, I'm going into a room full of uh, women who are uh, from different backgrounds, different experiences, that help shape the government policies that all of us want to see today. And this legislation was put together predominantly by women, Rashna and, and Dr. Francis among them, but many of the women that are sitting and I'm looking at today were key participants in the creation of this legislation, and we're so proud of that. This, this is just the first step on the road to building the anti-racist British Columbia we all want to see. But, as we all know from people more famous than me, with each journey you have to take that first step. And this has been a challenging step. Uh, we are now coming up to the fifth year since the, uh, the, the swearing-in of, of my government. 
And from day one, the direction to all ministers and all members of the government caucus was to build out the province we all wanted to live in, one that was inclusive, one that reflected the diversity that we represent outside of this building that was built uh, for other purposes by other people a long, long time ago. But today is the first step on that journey to reclaim this building, not just for those who sit in the legislature, but all of those in British Columbia who are represented by a diverse, dynamic group of people, opposition and government, that come here to make life better. And the accountability that will be within this act will be a result of the advocacy that's sitting in front of me. Never stop the advocacy and will never stop the accountability. La lastly, uh, because I know that, uh, that we're all anxious to get on to, uh, to the genuine celebration uh, of being together and, and, um, and going into the legislature and, and uh, preparing for uh, the speaker, uh, Raj Shohan, to uh, recognize the Attorney General who will stand and, uh, and, and continue to stand and stand and stand <laughs> uh, to deliver the legislation. I want you all, I want you all to know and acknowledge in your hearts that without you, this would not be happening. Without the countless people who came before you, this would not be happening. Without those who became, came before Roshna and I and, and Raj and Ravi and David, without those who built the foundation, we would not be on the precipice of the glory and the greatness that we want for this province. Inclusive, diverse, dynamic, and ready to take on any challenges at any time, together, arm in arm, men and women, people of color and non-people of color, working together, striving for the community that we all have in our hearts. What a great way to spend our day, huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hi, Thank you so much, Premier, for your commitment to the anti-racist BC, but also to man uh, like mandate letter that you gave to me to bring out this legislation and also our broader anti-racism act. But the mandate letter that you have given to all my colleagues to see their work from an anti-racism lens. Thank you so much. Thank you for paving this way. This act is the first step to put, uh, put an end to systemic racism in government services and programs, and paving the way to a more equitable, inclusive province. But we know that the work doesn't end here. It is clear that racism is very much alive in British Columbia. The staggering increase in discrimination during the pandemic has made that very clear. We need to come together as a society to commit to being anti-racist, as Premier has said, and calling out discrimination in all its forms when we see it. We will continue to engage with indigenous peoples and racialized communities over the coming months. It's essential that communities remain a part of the conversation around how their data is collected, used, and stored, and how we tackle racism more broadly. And next year, this work will be strengthened by the introduction of BC's first Anti-Racism Act. For now, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed to make this legislation a reality. The 13,000 people who shared their thoughts and experiences of using government services during our engagement process. Indigenous and Métis leadership across the province who have been involved in drafting, in developing this legislation. Kasari Gawander, BC's Human Rights Commissioner, and Dr. Mary R. Ellen Terpel Lafond, whose reports in 2020 were the foundation for this work, and staff from the ministries of Attorney General and Citizen Services, who have supported the engagement and drafting of this legislation. Many of them are sitting here. A big round of applause for them. Without your contributions, this historic legislation would not have been possible. And I want to make personal thank you to two people. Minister Evie, without his support, I wouldn't be standing here and presenting all this information that I have. And this legislation is, is, is in partnership with our Ministry of Citizen Services. A big thank you to my friend, 
Minister of Citizen Services, Lisa Beer. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. This is a historic moment, as I said, but I really appreciate you all coming here. Thank you so much. And now, this is an opportunity for some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to all reporters on the phone and in person, you are limited to one question and one follow-up. We'll start in the room with Richard Zussman, Global News. Premier, can you explain why uh, police are not included here in terms of being required to track data based on activity police are doing? And considering the report that you were presented last week, uh, what are your thoughts on reforming the Police Act in terms of how quickly you can move on some of those recommendations, including uh, getting rid of the RCMP uh, policing daily in this province? Well, there were, well, there's a lot packed into that question. That's how Richard gets one question and a follow-up. Uh, but uh, let, me, let me start firstly with uh, the, the, the role and function of this legislation and how it will fit into the range of uh, transformations we want to see uh, during the remaining term of this government. Uh, Prime Minister Secretary Singh talked about the introduction of the anti-racism legislation, which will follow the creation of this legislation and the implementation and the monitoring of the data as it comes forward. It was built on uh, the In Plain Sight uh, review that uh, Mary Ellen Trapelafond undertook and we will take the work of the all-party committee uh, with respect to uh, updating the Police Act and incorporate that in the work that we do. I don't believe they're separate, I believe that they all come together, which speaks again to process. There are a lot of things to pack together and unpack in the uh, the colonial history of British Columbia, and we won't be able to do that with one swing of the bat. We will have to do that by focusing on a range of component parts. The Declaration Act is a foundational piece in that transformation, and there will be many more to come. With respect to uh, the key elements of the All-Party Committee's findings, those will be reviewed by uh, the, part of the uh, Public Safety uh, Minister and the Solicitor General, and also, of course, we want to focus primarily on the mental health components. We need to revitalize me the Mental Health Act. The work done by the committee will help us do that. Law enforcement do not have the tools to deal with the myriad of challenges they face when they come to a doorstop or when they come to a, uh, any other engagement with the public. We want to make sure that they are as equipped as they can be, having access to, to social workers, having access to other health care providers so that a law enforcement situation doesn't emerge from a mental health situation. And that's, the, I, I think, the most powerful recommendations in the All-Party Committee report, and we're going to be moving quickly on those. The rest of it, uh, Minister Farnworth will have more to say about that in the days ahead. Uh, with respect to law enforcement and, and data, do you want to respond to that, Roshna? Yeah. Uh, Premier has already uh, said it, but I, uh, when we introduce this legislation, when we impl start implementing, uh, we want to focus on our core government programs first. And then, obviously, the, the scope is immense, uh, to moving on to the broader public services, and policing is one of the key areas that is emerging. The Police Act, uh, the Police Act Reform Report that has come, that has also talked about some key recommendations. But this is a process that we are taking. We are taking the steps to move towards that direction. That will come, but right now it's the core government programs. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? Are there metrics to determine if this is working in terms of the legislation, especially consider restoring confidence that many racialized communities don't have right now uh, in our institutions from healthcare to policing? How do you measure if this is working? I was just going to uh, see if Dr. Francis wanted to have a go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you get a much more comprehensive answer uh, from her. Do you, you want to uh, try and answer that question? Because uh, I think, uh, and I appreciate the question, uh, it is uh, obviously we need to build confidence in racialized communities that this is real. And the way you do that is by, as uh, Prime Minister Secretary Singh and her team did, is engage with those racialized communities, to engage with First Nations, and to bring them forward to create the act. The level of confidence is very high at this stage. We now, after introduction and then implementation, have to maintain that level of confidence by being transparent, by being accountable, and by turning to advocates periodically, and I, I'm not putting a time frame on that, 
uh, the, the advocates will know when we, we've, uh, we've misstepped, and uh, they will be quick to tell us that, and the challenge will be to respond effectively. But do you want to try and come into that? <laughs> I've never had this opportunity. <laughs> the first uh, but I'm, I'm just want to applaud the question because in fact if we do not put in milestones and measures um, we don't know where we're if you don't know where you're going and if you're getting there then there's no point in collecting the data but I do want to say a few things about data we have a tendency to use the colonial understanding of data data is not just about numbers Data is about knowing. Indigenous ways of knowing, racialized communities have different approaches through storytelling, through many other metrics that will help us to figure out if we're getting there. But I completely suggest two things. One is metrics matter, and that doesn't necessarily only mean numbers. And we need to decolonize that idea. Uh, and secondly, <laughs> and secondly, how is, are these numbers being used to turn into actual action? And that is what we need to look at. And then to measure at the end if we have gotten there. And again, decolonize that. How are we flourishing? How do we feel? Are we happy? You know, it doesn't, you know, how many times we go to the government office is not the point now, is it? Yeah. It's that we want to feel we belong, we're healthy, we have healthy families, and we're part of this enormously beautiful province. Next question is from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Um, Premier, how confident are you that the input of data here, which is primarily this BC uh, stats, population survey of random households voluntary in November is going to give you the data that you need to identify systemic racism in the core government services and when do you as premier expect to start getting that data in cabinet so you can make decisions about changing those services in a, in a kind of real way well that, that's a very good question we get data in cabinet all the time now to uh, to build policies and frame uh, decisions but we have been missing this key component. Uh, and, and now we're gonna be able to, based on the, uh, the receptivity of racialized communities to share that information, because quite oftentimes sharing information has led to negative outcomes, not positive outcomes. That's part and parcel of why uh, Roshna did such a comprehensive review, made sure that we went back again and again and again to build the confidence so that the community and the range of communities uh, have confidence that we were going to follow through. Uh, when we start, uh, I guess that we'll be starting in the fall and then continuing into the creation of the budget in 2023 and then again in 2024, th the more data we have, the more time we have to consult about what it means, uh, the better outcomes are going to be. This is a beginning and uh, I don't think anyone who's worked on this for uh, their entire lives and those who worked on it before the people in this room came to, to be uh, in front of organizations or in front of uh, government officials to put forward their case. I don't think they anticipated that there would be a solution in September. They are just grateful that we're taking that first step and we're doing it together. Have a shot. <laughs> Premier, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so what we, uh, that's, a, I think, a very valid question. Uh, we have been consulting with the communities. As we have mentioned, 30,000 people have already participated in our consultation. And that's, that's, those are the people, those are the community partners we want to take along as we implement this legislation. The today is the first step. The work does not stop today. The work basically starts uh, after the introduction of the data legislation. And about the population survey, that is one of the key uh, main, uh, like, Key, area, uh, key ways uh, to reach out to the population, but we will be consulting with the indigenous and racialized communities and partner with them to reach out to the most marginalized and more vulnerable po population so that everybody can be part of this data initiative. Nobody's left behind. Everybody is part of this uh, important historic legislation. 
also the impact, the results that are going to come out of this legislation. So continuous talks, continuous collaboration with the community partners. Rob, do you have a follow-up? And if I could, before you have a follow-up, Rob, I'll, I'll use an example of the Declaration Act. Uh, in and of itself, the tabling of the act was a historic moment, but more relevant to Indigenous communities was an announcement a few weeks ago about the action plan. Here are the steps we're going to take together to realize the, the promise of the Declaration Act. And, and similarly, uh, this legislation combined with that that we'll bring forward uh, with respect to an anti-racism piece of legislation will be that foundation on the journey ahead. So uh, I'm confident that uh, this is the best start we could have possibly hoped for, but we have miles to go, and uh, I know that we'll be uh, walking that, uh, that journey together. And, and that, uh, as someone who had been a critic more than I've been in government, uh, that is something that I'm very much looking forward to. Go ahead, Rob. In a somewhat related question, could you speak about the criticism you heard from Indigenous and racialized community leaders about Bill 22, the involuntary mental health uh, youth detainment overdose bill, and your government's decision to not proceed with that legislation? You've spoken in the past about your desire to do it, but clearly uh, there's opposition to that, and maybe you could speak about that. Yeah, well, that, that's a good question, uh, and, I, and I'm grateful to be answering it in the context of what we're doing here today, because I felt very strongly that uh, having met with parents who lost children, children uh, during the, the opioid crisis, the poisoned uh, d drug supply that has affected thousands and thousands of families in British Columbia, and I've spoken to those parents, and they were desperate for some action by government that would show that their child's life was not lost in vain. And I felt that the work that had been done about ensuring that if you were in, in, admitted to a hospital, an acute care facility, uh, uh, as a result of an overdose, and if, if clinicians determined that your well-being would benefit from a two or three more days in that acute care setting uh, to perhaps get into uh, uh, some other treatment regime, uh, I thought that was uh, a, a good first step, and I heard that from many parents. When we went to consult with the broader community, we met with significant resistance. And I go to, uh, to Dr. Francis's comment that process does matter. And what I've tried to do in my time as government, when I have such capable people as Roshna and the many others who are here today, is to not stand over their shoulder and tell them what I think is best, but to encourage them to go into the community and come back with what the community thinks is best. Uh, and I, uh, I am absolutely uh, ready to step away from my personal view on a piece of legislation to make sure that it is more reflective of the views of the broader community. And that is, in fact, what we're doing when it comes to the Mental Health Act. And there will be people that are disappointed with that, but there will be others, I hope, who will take that as an opportunity to redouble their efforts to fully engage with government so that we can put in place policies and programs to protect vulnerable populations from a toxic drug supply. And there are a range of issues that we're already working on. I don't need to inventory them today. But on the, the question you're asking, uh, did I want to see the legislation come forward? Yes, I did. I was given evidence that that wouldn't be the best way forward. And uh, as uh, my mom raised me, look at the new evidence and take your direction from that. Don't hold fast to yesterday's ideas. Hold fast to the confidence that you should have in the people who are working on this each and every day. And that's where we're going. Katie DeRosa, give son. Could you give a better um, explanation of which government core agencies will be collecting this? For example, BC Coroner Service, uh, the Independent Investigations Office, which deals with police shootings or police involved uh, injuries, um, healthcare system, like where will we, which core agencies will collect this? So uh, as, as we have consulted with the communities, the indigenous communities, the racialized communities, and we, we will continue to consult with them, like the key areas they would like us to focus, but also the population survey uh, that we are going to initiate uh, after this uh, legislation is uh, uh, passed in, in the legislature, and also the introduction of the anti-racism committee, keep taking the feedback from them, uh, and also, uh, a lot of data is already collected. That has been reported. Like a lot of data, the aggregated data that we have, just combining the data with the race variables and then putting into the core agencies that those can be uh, health core agencies like healthcare or education. But we will take the feedback from the communities. What are the organizations? What are the key sectors they would like us to focus on? Katie, do you have a follow up? Um, yes, and so how will you, how do you think this will restore trust with some of the racialized groups who have, again, lacked that trust? Um, 
how long will that take and, and how will you rebuild that? Well, it's difficult to answer how long does it take to rebuild trust. Uh, all of us have been in situations where we've lost faith in uh, an institution or an organization. And uh, it's the steps that you take as an individual and as an organization to rebuild that trust that is the, the measurement of success. So I, I can't predict how or when that will happen, but I can say confidently, based on uh, how responsive the community was to Parliamentary Secretary Singh and her overtures and the work of, uh, of others uh, to get to a place where we can walk together, that, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I know it's, uh, you know, we, we've, it's, it's been minutes since we said we were going to do this. Surely, to goodness, we should have had a result by now. Um, but, uh, but, and I apologize because the question is a legitimate one. I don't mean, uh, Katie, to d diminish your question. But uh, I think that we should reflect for a moment on the journey to get here, uh, celebrate that moment, as uh, Dr. Francis has so ably done for all of us, I think, and then tomorrow we get back to work and we continue to try and realize the society that we all want to be part of. But I think that motivation, when, when uh, racialized communities see uh, response as we did, uh, and there's work to be done on the In Plain Sight report, for example, uh, Minister Dix immediately uh, reached out to uh, Dr. Mary Antropella Fawn was available. She did a comprehensive review and we're still working on implementing those recommendations. Uh, the work with, uh, uh, Regional Chief T.G. and Robert and uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and, and the rest of the Leadership Council is foundational to building trust not just with the Leadership Council but uh, rights and title holders across British Columbia. And there has been an uneven response to that because of the experience that various rights and title holders have had to their engagements with colonial governments. So we have to build support and trust every day and you do that by, by walking the walk and being accountable, being transparent, out, outlining what you want to do, how you want to get there, and encouraging people to take that journey with you. And that's what we're doing today. Next question, Rob Buffum, CTV. Premier, I'm wondering if you can um, articulate or help me understand, once this data is gathered, you know, there's been concerns about systemic racism, for example, at the Royal BC Museum, uh, within healthcare, as we've talked about the In Plain Sight report, how do we take this data and then remove those barriers or get or eliminate systemic racism? How is this data practically going to be used to do that? Well, I, 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 I'd like to just pause for a minute on the uh, Royal BC Museum uh, and the leadership that's been shown there by the board and by senior executives to acknowledge and recognize systemic racism uh, and to work uh, before they were told to work on finding a solution. So I think there are organizations and institutions throughout British Columbia who with new leadership and new challenges are working with stakeholders, working with staff and, and other resources to identify problems and deal with them. The advantage of having a, a, a comprehensive race-based data collection is that we can shape policies at the provincial level and then implement those throughout government and indeed throughout communities. Uh, with confidence that we're doing so based on data, driven by the evidence, which uh, again, as Dr. Francis said, so many times in the past, race-based organizations or individuals have been asked, well, how do you know this is so? How do you know this is the case? And now we'll be able to say, because this says so right here. And it won't just be the metrics that we talk about in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, data in and data out. It will be a comprehensive understanding of what that means, talking about storytelling, talking about uh, traditional cultures, traditional um, uh, laws, which we see in Indigenous communities particularly, but not exclusively. Uh, the Chinese-Canadian community has been in British Columbia for uh, hundreds of years. The first uh, uh, Chinese settlers go back well before uh, Confederation in British Columbia, and those stories are going to be reflected in a Chinese-Canadian museum. And for me, education is the beginning of understanding in all things, and telling the stories are critical, and the storytellers should be those who walk that walk. And that's why we're putting together a, a similarly uh, historic and uh, museum-based uh, solutions to the various communities that make up our great province. P.S. Singh, I'd invite you up to answer if you have a question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so throughout this legislation, we have talked about the transparency and also about the, what we are going to do after this uh, legislation is introduced. Uh, the uh, appointment of the anti-racism 
committee, data committee, uh, collecting the population survey, uh, and then also the first report coming out. Uh, the, the timeline that we have, like next year, we will have the first report coming out. A lot of the policy work is already done, uh, and but using the race variables that will come out through that report, and also it is transparent. It is going to all the communities to. Uh, to check those numbers, like what are the inequities, what are the gaps, what are the barriers that we are facing, and also to make us accountable. Uh, Dr. Francis has talked about it, like how to uh, make governments accountable, and this is like what those reports are going to do. Do you have a follow-up? It's uh, on behalf of a colleague who wanted me to ask a question of Regional T uh, TG, if that's possible. Huh? don't know if that's... Oh, he's left. Okay. Sorry, he's um, gone. Okay. Well, uh, I, I wonder if the premier could weigh in. And I, well, it actually it, the question was directed towards an indigenous leader. I don't know if there's somebody available. Maybe Robert Phillips, if he's available. Is Robert still around. on? We can. Yeah. Okay. The question is basically. Yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. It relates um, to the recommendations to the Police Act that would have indigenous communities uh, having input into their police services and a reaction to that as well as providing a provincial police service instead of the yeah, RCMP. I, I, you're right, I can't, I can't speak to how Indigenous communities uh, and rights and title holders can respond to that, but Robert might. Uh, Robert, have you uh, reviewed the Police Act report yet? Yeah, the um, police reform work that's occurring is pivotal. Um, policing and, as you know, justice institutions in BC and across Canada have been challenged, and we reckon that there's been a, a history, as you know, very similar to systemic, not systematic, I think I said systematic, so systemic racism. And um, for Indigenous people, it's, it's a matter of life and death in some circumstances. And the reforms are, are looked forward to uh, in the justice system and in policing. So, uh, you know, because there's been so much harm at, at times and circumstances, there's been... Uh, you know, we want to improve the encounters uh, between policing and our Indigenous peoples. And uh, we know that uh, when it comes to this work, we want to do a reset and set a new foundation. Uh, the BC uh, First Nations Justice Strategy emphasizes the need to revitalize and stand up First Nations justice systems and laws, because it's been in place since time immemorial. And uh, certainly we want this to be on a government, the government basis with BC and a nation and nation with Canada. So the vision we have is, is a self-determined uh, system of justice that has to be recognized. And uh, it does need, we do believe, a complete overall. And uh, because we've had jurisdiction over our territories, our peoples, and it's based on our legal orders, cultural protocols, and our own understandings and approach to justice. So uh, again, we applaud the, uh, the uh, NDP government because they brought in the United Nations Declaration and the Declaration Act and the Action Plan. And we can get involved with the Attorney General and help co-develop these laws, which will make these reforms possible. And uh, I think because of that engagement with First Nations at all stages of the work, we can make this happen. But I do believe it does need a reset. Kukcha. Next question, Shannon Waters, BC Today. I think my colleagues have pretty thoroughly covered this um, legislation that's being introduced today, but I did want to ask both the Premier and the Parliamentary Secretary about the legislation that will sort of come out of this. Um, the Parliamentary Secretary mentioned that next year we'll get an anti-racism act specifically. What kind of scope do you see for that legislation at this point in time, and what I guess, what issues are you hoping to learn about through the data you'll be collecting over the next year? Uh, that's, that's a good question, and I don't want to uh, foreshadow that too much. I'll leave it to the person I've tasked to do that uh, to give you more detail. But, but our objective is to build uh, on each of the, the blocks that we've put in place since uh, coming uh, to government, like reestablishing the Human Rights Commission, for example, was uh, pretty fundamental, and I, I want to... Uh, He's still here. I was going. I thought he might have disappeared, but he has no caucus to go to. The speaker 
He's a, he has an office to himself. But it was uh, Raj and I have been colleagues uh, for eight, coming on 18 years. And I think the first thing he said to me when we met was, we need to reestablish the Human Rights Commission. And so, and almost every day from that point on, continued to remind me about these first steps that need to be taken. We all want, uh, and it's a, a result of the era that we live in, of instant gratification, making sure we get the things we want right away, but you have to build confidence, you have to build process. And you do that by taking sometimes small steps so that you can realize larger steps later when there's unanimity of purpose within community. And that, that building uh, will be a, a result of the success of this piece of legislation and the process that uh, Roshner was involved in, and then we'll build on that going into the larger piece of legislation. I would love to, to say that we're going to do it next week, but again, I've already a very good question from one of your colleagues. Uh, I, I, at no time do I impose my will on my colleagues. I say to my colleagues, this is what I'm hearing, what are you hearing? And when new information becomes available, all of us, whatever we do, wherever we do it, should assess that information and then reassess how we're going forward together. And, and that, that's the intention here, and, and I'm confident that uh, based on uh, the, the, the enthusiasm for the work that uh, Parliament Secretary Singh has done to get to this stage, that as we go to the next step, uh, we'll see more and more people participating and we'll get a better product as a result. Uh, the process is the key, uh, the extensive process that we went through to come to this legislation, to, uh, to have this legislation be presented in the legislation. The more than 13,000 people who participated in our consultations. And that's the same process that we want to continue. It is we are making it as a standard for any kind of uh, consultations that we do. And the, I know with our consultations that we did for this uh, legislation, a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm for the broader anti-racism act. But we really want to go back to the communities, the indigenous, black, and racialized communities, to hear from them what would they like to see in their act. Thank you. We have time for one more question. We'll go to the phone lines. Lisa Yusta, City News. Hi, just, I guess a pretty quick question. I'm just wondering, for someone who's sitting at home who will be listening to my story or listening, reading someone's story, I'm wondering, you know, how does this help them? If they're hesitating going to the hospital because they're concerned about racism or if they're just not going to go, how is this going to help them? Or do they just have to wait a couple more years for things to change? And well, not just hospitals and all kinds of different services. Well, I, I would like to think that uh, people f from racialized communities who are hearing and seeing this, perhaps for the first time, uh, as you know, uh, I live by the adage, you wouldn't worry what people thought of you if you knew how seldomly they did, because most people are living their lives, uh, whether they be in racialized communities or, or not. And so the people that have gathered today, the people that have worked on this, understand the value of bringing forward legislation that can help affect positive policies to change systemic racism. If, if you're in need of medical care, you should go to an acute care facility, whether you're a racial, from a racialized community or not. Uh, we need to build confidence in communities over time. And this is a step in that direction. The Declaration Act is a step in that direction. Reestablishing the Human Rights Commission, a step in that direction. But it takes time to build back confidence where none existed for decades. In fact. In, in fact, for literally generations of Indigenous peoples who have been traumatized by policies that were made long before most of us were even uh, a thought in the, in the eyes of those who brought us into the world. But that does not change the fact that all of us have a responsibility today to acknowledge and recognize that generational trauma and take steps today and tomorrow to ensure that A, that doesn't happen again, and B, what comfort can we give to those who are traumatized that we are going to be there for them, to lift them up and celebrate all of the fantastic things that we have to celebrate in British Columbia. That's what I hope your listeners will hear when they think about this legislation. A new day is dawning in British Columbia where all of our diversity is celebrated each and every day, not as, as a moniker of multiculturalism, but as a beacon to the rest of the world that if you come to British Columbia, you're part of a greater undertaking, a great experiment in justice and love and equality. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? So what I'm hearing, I guess, is a little bit of patience in knowing that each of these things are building. And I don't know if Parliamentary Secretary Singh, I, I just was hoping for a little bit more detail following up on Rob Bubba's question about how this will be practically used. Am I to understand 
that many of these policies are sort of sitting there waiting to go and this data will give the evidence to back it up or will there be new policies written and are there any particular that you're thinking might be the focus to start? Uh, as uh, Premier has already mentioned, that we are uh, moving towards uh, a, a, a province, uh, a system, uh, especially in our programs, that are equitable, like the, where there are no gaps for the racialized or the indigenous communities. And the process that we are going to take, like it is not something that will happen instantly. We are on the path towards creating British Columbia, and through this uh, act, uh, and also the upcoming act, making an anti-racist British Columbia. But the process, I think, has started, like the process started uh, to create the framework for this legislation. The pro uh, we will start collecting the, uh, pop uh, we will do the population survey, have the anti-racism data committee lo look on any kind of, like if any kind of community harm is being done to point it out. So a lot of emphasis has been done on no community harm, no further marginalization or stigmatization of the communities that have been left behind for far too long. And also to once the results of those population survey come out and the report comes out, as I mentioned before, putting those in the policies that are already, already in place, uh, the policies that uh, the work is already happening, but putting that uh, uh, the racial angle, the, all the social factors, the intersectional factors, combining them and putting them into the policy work that is already happening. So you, we will start seeing the changes uh, about this in the coming, especially after the first report, that we will see these changes uh, that will impact all the communities, all of us, and benefit us. That's all the time we have for questions.